Hello, good morning and welcome to our live streaming at Cliff Oak Church. We hope you are all well and, uh, and coping with this uh, lockdown which is nearly, nearly, nearly done. We praise Lord for that. Uh, I would like to invite you to read Psalm 95 with me, which is a psalm of, of praising God for who he is, really. Please open your Bible with me, Psalm 95 from verse 1. And we read as follows. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his land. Amen to that. Let's just worship our God right now, shall we? Lord, we worship you at this moment for who you are. You are our God, our Lord, the King above all kings, the God above all gods. You are the creator. You are our creator. Lord, we thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for providing to us, providing to our families and friends. And we thank you because this moment of lockdown is passing and we will be again worshiping you together with open doors. Lord, be with us from now on with the rest of this service where we are going to worship you with songs of praise and we are, we are going to worship you learning a bit more of your word. And we thank you. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In his name and his precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for for be with us here and hope you enjoy the rest of the service god bless you Thank you. 
servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, 
but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Amen. Thank you, Glenis. I've written myself a little sticker saying, speak up. So I'll put that on the screen and hopefully that will remind me just to uh, raise my voice a bit. So thank you for that, those who made that comment last week. Last week we were celebrating Pentecost and I described that the original Pentecost day when God's spirit came and filled ordinary people as the most world changing day in human history. The day whose impact is only uh, felt in increasing measure as time goes on. There's no aspect of our lives today, physical, mental, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, that's not been shaped by what began on that first Pentecost day. In saying this, of course, I fully recognise there are many other significant days and events that have happened. A year ago, we'd have all said Brexit is the thing which was most significant. At this very moment, we have the coronavirus affecting almost every waking moment. And in the last fortnight, we've seen another event, the killing of George Floyd by American police officers. I'm sure that we're all appalled and sickened by what we've seen and heard. Yet as a white person, I must acknowledge that this is not the first time that this has happened, nor is it a problem that has not shown its ugly face here in the United Kingdom. It has, and we do see these things going on. How should we respond? We should speak up against injustice in our society because we're called to be salt and light, seeking to influence society for good. And that needs us to speak up about the injustices and to point the way to what is salt and light, what is good, the change that we need to see. So as Christians, we should speak up. We should also pray. Pray for those who are hurting. Pray for change. And as a church, we should show that there is a different way to relate to others. There is God's way of respect and care and acceptance. 
and about those who commit these hideous crimes, what should we say and do? Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This is the fifth of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 that we began some weeks ago to look at on Sunday mornings. We've taken a two week break for Ascension and then for Pentecost. And the next one we come to in the Beatitudes is this one. Blessed are the merciful. It never ceases to amaze me, the relevance of God's word to our daily lives. Those first four Beatitudes that we previously focused on were really looking at our relationship with God, the poverty of spirit that we need, the mourning of our sin, the humility in our hearts, the desire and the hunger for righteousness. And now Jesus turns in the Beatitudes, turns from our relationship with God to our relationship with our fellow humans. And the first thing he calls us to be is to be merciful. Merciful, full of mercy. Jesus spoke quite a lot about mercy, actually. Tell it, he told the story of the Good Samaritan. I don't need to recap that as such, I'm sure, at this moment. And having told the story, he asked the teacher of the Jewish law who posed him that question, didn't he, about who is my neighbour? He told the story and then he said, well, who was the neighbour to that man? And the teacher replied, it was the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus turned to that teacher and said to him, now you go and do likewise. You go and be merciful. Outside Jericho one day, Jesus was walking along, accompanied by his disciples and quite a crowd as always. And two blind men called out to him, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and asked them, what do you want me to do for you? His stopping, his questioning, his very question were, of course, the beginnings of his act of mercy to those two men. And it was, of course, Jesus who taught us the parable of the unmerciful servant there in Matthew 18 that Glenys has read for us. And as we saw that parable was given in response to Peter asking that question about how many times must I forgive my brother? Sounds like there was quite a problem between Peter and Andrew. <laughs> and Jesus has to say to him 77 times, Peter, because using the word that's the perfect word, so making it an infinite number by repeating that word, that number. You remember at the end of that parable that Jesus then told. The master said to the servant, shouldn't you have shown mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? What does it mean to be full of mercy? Let me make a number of points. Firstly, this, it is not the world's way. Let's acknowledge that. The world's way is to get revenge, isn't it? To retaliate, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And in saying that that's, it, it's not the world's way, it's therefore not the natural way. It's not the instinctive way that we grow up with which is this way of revenge and retaliation. So we are being called to be different in being called to be merciful. Secondly, it's not about ignoring 
wrong. It's not about blurring right and wrong into, well, it's just something that happens. It's not about ignoring what is wrong and calling wrong wrong. And it's not about denying hurt that we suffer as a consequence of the actions or inactions of others. Being merciful is an attitude and an action of our own hearts when they are filled by God's Spirit. Let me say that again. Being merciful is an attitude and an action of our own hearts when we are filled by God's Spirit. It involves letting go of that desire for revenge, of that anger that we have, of that bitterness which has developed in our lives as we've thought about things and allowed our emotions to interact with our anger. It involves letting go of those things. Remember that God says, Vengeance is mine. At the same time he says that in scripture, as he then says, overcome evil with good. Let me read from Romans 12, verse 17. We read these words. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Being merciful involves, at its heart, forgiving. As happened in that parable, as the master did to the servant and cancelled his debts and said, you don't know, owe me anything. You're not obliged to me any longer. That was, of course, what the servant was unwilling to do to his fellow servant, to forgive him and release him from the debt. But being merciful at the heart of it, is forgiving, forgiving. And the act of forgiving does not require the other person to do or to say anything. That's reconciliation. That requires two people. But forgiving, being merciful, is just one-sided. It is what we choose to do. What we can choose to do on our own about another person who has hurt us, who has offended us, who has wronged us. Here's a picture of the Reverend Anthony Thompson and his wife Myra. And I want to read you a story about them and as I begin to read the story I think all of us will start to remember the story and connect with it. On the evening of the 17th of June 2015, so almost five years ago, Myra Thompson was leading a Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Church in Charleston South Carolina for the first time. 21 year old Dylan Roof had joined late. He wasn't known to any of the 12 attending the study, but had been welcomed by them all. He sat quietly as Myra shared. An hour later, as they finished in prayer, and while everyone else's eyes were closed, Roof took out his concealed gun and opened fire. 
Many died instantly. In a flurry of 77 bullets were released. Roof stood over his victims, shooting again and again as they lay on the floor. He paused five times to reload, shouting hateful racist slurs as he shot them. Some played dead and miraculously escaped his gunfire. Eight of the church members died at the scene and one died later. They became known as the Emmanuel Nine. Having received a phone call to tell him that there had been a shooting, the Reverend Anthony was one of the first people on the scene. Upon arriving, he couldn't find Myra, but one of the survivors, Felicia Saunders, said, Anthony, Myra's gone. He ran outside and started praying, Lord, please let her be all right. If she's not okay, don't let her suffer. Officials were all over the church and were keeping guard outside. It took five of them to hold the pastor down as he tried to run frantically to find his wife. When Ruth was brought before a preliminary court hearing, the Reverend Anthony had been reluctant to attend, but he did and was surprised when the judge read out each victim's name and asked relatives if they wanted to say something. Anthony was determined not to speak, but then found God telling him, get up, get up. So he got up. I said, God, whatever it is you have to say, you better say it because I don't have anything to say. So come on, don't embarrass me up there. His account continues, as I walked to the podium, God reminded me that I was his child. Dylan was his child. He reminded me that I was a sinner and Dylan was a sinner. And I'm saying to myself, you've got to be kidding. I'm not going to tell people that I'm a sinner. If that's what you want me to say, I'm going to sit down. But he just kept on coming. And so by the time I got to the podium, I'm thinking, yes, you know, I am a sinner, and Dylan's a sinner, and I should be able to forgive him, just like God's forgiven me. So I looked at Dylan from the podium and said, Son, I forgive you. In Jesus' name, my family forgives you. Ruth kept his gaze down throughout the hearing, but when Anthony uttered the name of Jesus. He looked right into the reverend's eyes. I was able to really pierce into his eyes, almost into his very soul, and I saw a hurt man. As he was walking back to his seat, the reverend Anthony's body started shaking. From my neck, my shoulders, my arms, like something was going through my fingers, I felt something leaving me, but I couldn't see it. And when that was over, I had this peace like none other. I mean, man, God took away my burdens that I was bearing. He took away the pain I was feeling. He took away the anger and the hate. He just took it all away. It was gone. So I know that forgiveness heals. I know that forgiveness, what forgiveness can do to a person's life, it changes you dramatically. There was a huge variety of responses to the Reverend Anthony's public statement of forgiveness. Some said he forgave too quickly, that he didn't give himself enough time to grieve. Others said you can't forgive somebody who has such evil intent, who has shown no remorse. And the Reverend Anthony's response, well, yes, I've heard all that and some more. You know, all those questions were just foolish to me. Forgiveness is a choice. And when we choose to forgive, we allow God to do the judging. We're asking him to take over because the Bible says we don't take revenge. Biblical forgiveness is followed by prayer for the offender. It's not about a feeling. In my case, it was a divine intervention. It takes God to help you to forgive, even if you want to. You can't do it on your own. At the close of his trial in January 2017, Ruth was found guilty 
and sentenced to death by lethal injection. He is now on death row, awaiting the date of his execution. The Reverend Anthony has written to him. In that letter, I made him aware of who my wife was so that he can see that she was a real person, not just a black person. I wanted him to know that I still forgive him no matter what. He also told Ruth that he would be happy to visit him and help him to give his life to God if he wanted to do that. The Reverend is yet to receive a reply. Charleston expected raw violence to explode on the streets in reaction to the racist crime. It had happened before in other cities, following other major cases. And that is exactly, of course, what Ruth wanted. His intent was to start a race war. And he was looking for a way to make that happen, knowing that slavery in Charleston had run deep. He figured Emmanuel Church was the place to start. Yet in Charleston, God's grace and mercy poured out. Some of the other victims, loved ones, also extended forgiveness to Ruth. We had people from other cities come here, actually wanting to start a riot. They were just waiting for us to give the OK. We told them to go back to where they came from. That's why nothing happened here. The fact that we forgave united the community. People from all walks of life and race and creed united. And the tragedy started to do something new in Charleston. Much has happened in the city in the five years since, including the removal of the Confederate flag and an official apology for its role in slavery. Each year on the anniversary of the shooting, Charleston commemorates the Emanuel Nine through events and programmes that highlight unity. When asked what he hoped would be the ongoing legacy of those who lost their lives in the shooting, the Reverend Anthony replies that we come together as a people and define each other not by the colour of our skin, not by our status in life, not by our occupation, but just by who we are. We get to know each other like neighbours. That's what we're trying to do in Charleston. What an extraordinary testimony that and the Reverend Anthony, he's going to be speaking uh, on Premier Christian uh, radio this coming Saturday, apparently, giving recounting his story. We have a God who is merciful, a God who is full of mercy. And we can only forgive and show mercy when we do it in his strength. Most of us, we don't have to forgive in such a tragic and hard situation as the Reverend Anthony found. But saying that, I know for some of us, there are tough situations have happened and events in our lives that we either have forgiven or we need today to forgive and show mercy. But so let's none of us make excuses this morning why we cannot forgive others, whatever, whatever the injustice and the wrong that we have suffered. If we do, Jesus says, we are blessed, blessed are the merciful. We are blessed. We receive mercy from God himself. That's the greatest way that we are blessed. We know God's mercy to us, a sinner. We know that we've done the right thing. Our greatest blessing is, of course, that we receive God's mercy. We know God's forgiveness. We know his favour towards us in our lives. That's a wonderful blessing, a 
a wonderful blessing. As we, we are blessed also because we, we know that we've done the right thing. We've pleased God by showing mercy and forgiveness. We know we've done the right thing and we've shown something of his character in our lives. We've let his light shine through us into the world, showing the world what God's mercy and forgiveness is like as we demonstrate it. Showing mercy and forgiving is, of course, therefore good for our own spiritual health. And it's also good for our, our emotional, our mental health. And it's good for our physical health. The evidence is so clear about these things, even from the world, that the act of forgiving is good for the forgiver as well as the forgiven. As Christians, we know that we are blessed. God blesses us as we show mercy and as we forgive. So this morning we was just, each of us, answer the very straightforward question, who do we need to forgive this morning? Who is it that has hurt us, has done wrong towards us, and we have not yet forgiven? And this morning God says to us, forgive. Be full of mercy this morning. Do what Jesus wants us to do this morning. Follow his example. Follow God's example. Follow the Reverend Thompson's example. And forgive this morning. Forgive those who have hurt you. Let us pray. Father, this morning we come before you. And as we reflect upon our own lives, we realise that, yes, Lord, we need to forgive. You know for each of us personally, the people that we need to forgive. And Lord, before you this morning, we want to begin that forgiving. We want to begin that letting go of the anger and the hurt that we hold in our lives, the bitterness that has grown in our lives. We want to begin, Lord, to let go of those things that we might receive instead your grace and your mercy into our lives. And Father, as we think of ourselves and our need to forgive, Lord, our hearts and minds go across to the situation in America. And those, again, who have faced, been on the receiving end of such tragedy, have had such appalling events happen to their family. And we pray for them that they also may come to the place of being able to follow that example from Charleston. And Lord, that they and we may overcome evil with good, by doing good, your good, in this world. Lord, we know there is no hope for this world outside of you and what you have to offer. So may we as your people show you and your goodness in this world we pray. We ask this for your glory's sake. Amen. We're going to play and have the opportunity to join in uh, singing the words of a short little song but it has lovely words then won't appear on the screen so uh, I'll post them 
uh, in the comments on Facebook as it comes. It's lovely words. Your mercy flows upon us like a river. Your mercy stands unshakable and true, most holy God of all good things, the giver. We turn and lift our fervent prayer to you. Hear our cry, O Lord, be merciful. Once more, let your anger, let your love, your anger stem. Remember mercy, O Lord, again. Let's enjoy singing these words together. Hello, ABC family. We wanted to do something a little more personal this week. So this will be from our home to yours. And hopefully you can sing along as we take up this simple prayer together. Your mercy One of the great things <coughs> we do when we meet together on Sundays is sing happy birthday to anyone who has a birthday uh, during the coming week. And we're not going to do that, but if it's your birthday, you're welcome to post your uh, name on Facebook uh, at this moment. And we wish you a very happy birthday uh, through this week. And this evening we'll be here on Facebook at 6.30 in Portuguese. During the week, we have various uh, meetings on Zoom, including on Wednesday, we continue our Bible studies in Joshua. And on Friday, the women meet together as well. If you want uh, to access those, please just send a message in. We'd be delighted to have you join with us. The last thing we always do when we gather together is to say the grace to one another. And so I invite you just to join with me. Uh, and say these words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God bless you this week and I look forward to seeing you uh, on Zoom.